just remain standing for the reading of the, the for key verse this morning. I'd like to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 to 8. And if we could, let's all just read it together. Ask, or wait, first, does everyone have it? Sorry, starting before people are. If you have it, say amen. amen. All right, let's, let's read together. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Father God, I just ask you, Lord, to seal this word. Lord, I pray that you would speak to your people. I have nothing in myself. You must speak through me. My lips, your voice. Hide me behind your cross, Lord. May your people be edified. May they hear what you have to speak to them this morning. Nothing from my heart, nothing from my spirit, but your Holy Spirit alone. Give me grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. I see a lot of smiling faces. I don't know if you're happy to see me or you're just happy because you got an extra hour of rest this morning. Um, I had a little smile on my face this morning. I was like, oh, this is great. Imagine having an extra hour every morning, right? Um, so now that we all have had an extra hour of rest, I'm hoping that everyone's very attentive this morning to the word of the Lord. The uh, sermon this morning, the title is entitled The Audacity to Ask. I don't know if they have, oh, very nice. Thank you. AV team always does such a great job with all these banners and... Um, the audacity to ask. We all ask things of the Lord. We have very numerous and varied needs. We, uh, can I use this? Does this work? Can I work? Can I use this? Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. We have a very numerous personal needs. Our personal prayers are probably littered with personal prayers and supplications, maybe disproportionately so. When we, when we pray, maybe it's more about what we need, what we're asking for, uh, things that we want. And I, as a child, I remember, and you probably can relate to this as a child, um, your prayers probably consisted more of, bless mom, bless dad, bless Amaji, bless Amaji, bless pastor, bless everyone, give me this, give us this. Um, and I'm no exception to that. I smile when I think about those days. And maybe you do too. But if I'm honest with myself, even now as an adult, probably more of my prayer than I'd like to think is in some way, shape, or form catered towards, give me this, give me that, bless me with this, or bless those I love with this. Scripture is filled with instances of the Lord encouraging us that we should ask and that he will answer and provide. John chapter 14, verse 14 says, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. John chapter 16, verse 24, at the Last Supper, Jesus says to his disciples, until now, you have not for asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Yet often, don't you find sometimes that our prayers seemingly go unanswered for long periods of time? Sometimes we may feel that we can't hear anything from the Lord, despite our many prayers. If you find yourself relating to me this morning with an unanswered prayer or a long-standing prayer, I want to encourage you this morning with a word that I believe the Lord has laid on my heart for you this morning. Did you notice the qualifier in, in both of those verses? What was the common thing that there's a qualifier? It says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And oftentimes we think, in my name, okay, so if I say, in Jesus' precious name, I pray, amen, then anything I asked for before is in Jesus' name. And as a child, that's what I thought. That's what we, when he said, ask in my name, so I just tag that on to the end of my prayer, and I've asked in his name. But what is that really? Have we considered what that means? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Let me submit to you that the how and the why of our prayers are as important as the what we are praying for. How you pray, why you pray, 
is as or more important than what you are praying for. James chapter 4, verse 2, and I know there are scholars of the word of God here. You may know it. You might be able to recite it by heart. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. We'll unpack that a little bit later, but let's look at those who have asked audacious things of the Lord in Scripture. We ask and we want to claim in faith that whatever we ask in the Lord's name, we will receive it, right? So let's look at the Scripture. There's no better place than God's Word to have instruction for our life. And I apologize. I don't actually apologize this morning. You're going to hear a lot of Scripture this morning. You're not going to hear a lot of me. But that's intentional. I do not fancy myself some kind of teacher. The Holy Spirit is our teacher this morning. And you cannot learn unless you hear the word. So I'm just going to use the voice that God gave me to speak what he's already spoken to all of you. And I'm going to depend on the Holy Spirit to unwrap certain things and bring to your remembrance the things that the Holy Spirit has dealt with each of you individually because I can't do that. I am powerless to do that, but he has all the power, amen, to unwrap that for us. The first person who asked audaciously, well, there are many, but the first person that I'm going to unwrap here is the Syrophoenician woman. You may know this story well. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 to 28. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she replied. Even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. There's a couple of things there in that passage. The first thing is she recognized his position. She acknowledged his lordship and his messiahship as a woman who is not part of the children of Israel. She called him Lord, and she said, son of David. She understood the messiah is the son of David. That's not simply that, oh, you were descended from David. That's a title that is assigned to messiah. The second thing is faith and confidence. She displayed her belief in his full ability to heal her daughter. Humility. She put herself in a vulnerable position. For she came to Jesus as a Gentile, knowing that Jews have no real dealings with Gentiles. And then when he denied her initially at first, she came down and knelt before him. She put herself in a very humble position. She begged and she persisted. Even when there was no response or any realistic expectation at all that Jesus needed to answer her request as a Gentile. The second is blind Bartimaeus. You may recall him as well. There's similar elements in both of these stories, and that's the reason that I'm doing these back to back. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. We see the same four elements there. Recognition of his position, faith in his ability to provide, humility to come before him, even when everyone was telling him to be quiet, and persistence in the, aver the face of adversity and challenge. So persistence is so important in our prayer. Do you feel that you're ever praying to a brick wall? I have. I think many of you have. Sometimes you feel, you know God is there, but it feels like there's a blockage there. I can't get through. 
Do you ever feel like giving up? I have. Maybe you have too. Do you ever think that you're annoying God with your requests? That he's just not interested? And that you should just stop? Let me take you to a founding father of faith. Maybe the founding father. The father of faith. So we can explore how God views our persistent asking. How does he see us when we ask? We have all kinds of feelings about what we think he feels. Let's look to the scripture to see. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. You all know this story. I'm not preaching any obscure passages. These are all very common passages. I'm just preaching what's in the word of God. That's plain. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, this is one of my favorite passages, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. This is important. The Lord was pleased with Abraham. We must understand, and if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. The Lord is pleased with us this morning. You may not feel that God is pleased with you. You may feel that God is angry at you. The Lord is pleased with you this morning. And those that the Lord is pleased with, he has no problem to hear their request. And his heart is to answer lavishly all that we ask in his name. Why do I say that? If you have accepted his son, Jesus Christ, then you are in him. And what did the, the father attest about the son when he got baptized? He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So all who listen to him, all who are in him, the Lord is pleased with on account of being in him. And that's the pretext for the conversation that follows and the audacity that Abraham employs in his asking. This is an amazing scripture. That the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men went off to Sodom. I don't have enough time, so I'm going to paraphrase this. Abraham approached him and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50? Far be it for you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will you, the judge of all the earth, not do right? And the Lord says, if I find 50, I won't do it. Then Abraham replies again, now that I've been so bold, asked to speak, he already knew he was out of pocket to ask this. He said, now that I've been so bold as to speak, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number is five less than 50? And Jesus said, or Jesus, God says, if for the sake of 45, I will not destroy it. Once again, what if only 40? For the sake of 40, I will not. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry with me. He's, he's testing the waters. He's, no, he's, he's pushing the envelope a little bit here with these requests. What if only 30? He said, I will not if I find 30. Abraham says again, now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not. Then, may the Lord not be angry. Let me speak once more. What if only 10? And he answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. You hear a lot of things there from Abraham. So bold, I know. Don't be angry with me, but was there anything in that passage to indicate that the Lord was angry with Abraham? Nothing at all. What we get from that passage is the Lord was pleased. It's, in fact, it's on the Lord's inclination that he's sharing his counsel with Abraham. Can I hide this from him? I want to have a conversation with him. Ask your questions, Abraham. The Lord never cuts off Abraham. The Lord leaves when Abraham's done asking. He waits for Abraham to ask. He didn't leave Abraham until Abraham had nothing else to say. Our Lord is patient with us in our asking. He's pleased with his children. You don't have to be afraid to ask and to ask and to ask and to ask again. He's here for us just as he was there for Abraham.
And that doesn't mean, mind you, that our prayers get instant gratification. The same case, Abraham, we know, he was given a promise. He was in that land because of a promise. At 75, he was given a promise that I will make you a great nation. He had to wait 25 years for the fulfillment of that promise. But it happened in God's perfect time, in his perfect way, in the preordained time of his choosing. Moses makes maybe the most audacious ask in all of the Old Testament. Anyone guess what I'm going to go to here? Yeah, show me your glory. Can you imagine a mortal man going to God and saying, show me your glory. Show me your face. I've seen the Red Sea split. I've seen you do all of these plagues. Your mighty hand and outstretched arm struck Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and you led us through, but that's not enough. I'm talking to you like a friend with a friend, but I, I need to see you. I want to see you, God. And what does the Father say to him? What does God say to him? No man came and can look upon my face and live. You've asked an impossible thing. An audacious ask for a mortal man to ask of an immortal God whose face no man could see and live. But there's a context for this, and it's found earlier in the chapter, in 7 to 17. And again, I, don't, I can't read the whole thing, but Moses, the short of it is this. Moses pitched a tent and called it the tent of the meeting. And every time he went up, envision this in your mind's eye, all the people of Israel would get up, and they would go to the entrance of their tent, and they would watch Moses go to the tent of the meeting to meet with God. He went to a place to meet with God. And the pillar of cloud that was leading them would settle over the whole place. So the whole place was filled with the cloud. And every man at his tent would bow and worship because of the presence of God that was so heavy in that place. And he would stay and talk with God as a friend with a friend, as no man had ever done before. And there's another thing there. Joshua, the son of Nun, he would stay there. Even after Moses left, Joshua would linger. He would chase that presence. He needed more of that. Whatever Moses had, I need to stay here. I need to linger here in this place. And then Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. Again, Moses had found favor with God. If you are pleased with me, Teach me your way so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses says, we all, we all pray this, pray this many times. If your presence does not go with us, then don't send us up from this place. If your presence doesn't go with this church, don't let us go any further. If your presence doesn't go with my marriage, don't let us go any further. Where can we go from your presence if your presence doesn't go with us? How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and my people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Can I tell you something this morning? The Lord is pleased with each of you. No matter what the enemy has told you this morning, he knows each of you by name, each and every one. No matter how faithful you think you've been or unfaithful, if you are in him, he is pleased with you and he knows you by name. Moses asked audaciously because he knew his God, because he spent the time lingering in the presence of God and he desired to know him even more intimately than he already had. He said, this is not enough. There's more. I know there's more. I must have it. Show me your glory. Moses, the, for Moses, the audacity to ask came from the comfort of proximity to, relationship with, and favor from the Lord with the approval of his mission. The Lord answered his request, and what happened after that? Forever after that, in the presence of Israel, he had to wear a veil over his head because the glory that he had beheld made his face shine. It made his face shine. Note that Joshua also had a similar proximity, just as Moses was there. And even longer after Moses had left, Joshua would linger. Joshua also asked audaciously. Audacious, maybe one of the most audacious things in Scripture. 
And I see nods. People know where I'm going with this. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord, not to the sun, not to the moon, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you moon over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. Incredible. The only time in history that the sun and moon stood still in the sky of one man's request to fulfill the command of the Lord and vanquish those whom the Lord had commanded him to wipe out. Just because it was in the Lord's will for that to happen. He knew it. He said, Lord, you've asked me to do this. You've commissioned me to do this. Therefore, sun, moon, don't move until I've done what the Lord has commanded me. And the sun and the moon listened. Audacious asking. Again, relationship with God, proximity to the presence of God, and favor with God, and approval of his mission. But John, this Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 to 13, that verse, it doesn't happen without Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, stayed by the tent. He lingered in the presence of both Joshua and Caleb saw what God did in Egypt. They saw the plagues of Egypt. They saw the Red Sea split. They saw the peals of thunder and lightning from Mount Sinai as God, even with an audible voice, spoke to his people. And the people said, Moses, you talk to God for us. We cannot bear it. They, they saw all those things. But who else saw those things? Ten spies who went with Joshua and Caleb. They saw all the same things. And they entered the land of Canaan, scouting the land. Four decades before, Joshua told the sun and the moon to stop. The other ten trembled in fear at the giants of the land, mighty men. They were scared. Those that saw the sea split with the blast of the nostrils of the Lord, they, were, they shied away because they were tall people in a land. But Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. It says they had an excellent spirit. And they watched as all of those other ten spies and a whole generation of their people perished in the wilderness over the next 38 years. So now enter into Caleb. Caleb was there with Joshua at 85 years old. I'm not preaching anything obscure. You all know everything that I'm about to preach. That's okay. At 85 years old. And I think Felix, Pastor Felix spoke on this too. But I'm going to share it because it's very relevant to this. We see him go to Joshua in the land of promise. He says, I'm 85 years old. I'm just as strong now as the day that I walked into the land of Canaan and encouraged people to take the land. I'm just as strong now. Give me the hill country in Canaan, in a land of giants. I'm not worried about the giants in the low place. Let me fight uphill against the people that are the biggest people in this land. I will take the land. And scripture tells us that God gave him the grace to do so at 85 years old. He asked audaciously, but with full faith and confidence, that the God who delivered them from Egypt and the God who led them through the wilderness would lead him to victory. We know a lot about Joshua and Caleb. We may not have heard about the next person I'm speaking about. I'm going to give a lot of you credit. You probably have heard about her. Caleb had one daughter. Her name was Aksa. Aksa. It means adorned or anklet. You can see already how Caleb thought about his daughter by the way he named her. And this is in a time when daughters were not necessarily as desired as sons, couldn't do as much for their fathers as maybe a son could. But he named her adorned, an anklet, a glory. But daughters also had very limited to no inheritance rights. And we see two passages in both Joshua and Judges where they refer to Aksa. And I'm going to read the one in Judges. They're essentially the same. Then Caleb said, whoever attacks carrieth Sephir, which was a place, and takes it, to him I will give my daughter Aksa as wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. So he gave him his daughter Aksa as wife. Now what happened when she came to him, that she urged him, that's Othniel, to ask her father for a field, and she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, what do you wish? So she said to him, give me a blessing. Since you've also given me land in the south, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. She had no right to ask this, but she urged her husband, went on her donkey to her father, got off the donkey, and just leveled with her father. She said, 
I need land, but this land is in the south. It's dry. I need water to irrigate it. Give me water so I can irrigate this land. And the father gave upper springs and lower springs, as much as you want. He loved his daughter so much. We're going to go back to Aksa in a little bit. One of the most profound instances of audacious asking is also found in 2 Kings. 2 Kings, yes. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, where Elisha is being handed over the mantle of leadership from Elijah. What does Elisha ask Elijah for? A double portion of what spirit? Elijah's spirit. Elijah's spirit. Not the Lord's spirit. Elijah, whatever spirit you have, I want double of that. Give me double of that. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, 2 Kings 2, verse 9 to 10, Tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. Elijah himself admitted it's a difficult thing, but we know what happened. He had the audacity to ask. This is a man who poured water over the hands of Elijah, watched everything he did, and he said, what that man has, I need that. Not only do I need that, Israel needs that, and we need double of that to go forward into the future. If I have to lead, I need double of what you have, Elijah. He asked out of his relationship to Elijah, even though it was an audacious ask. But on this side of the cross, in the new covenant, we have something much better than Elijah's spirit. What do we have? The Holy Spirit. Elijah's spirit, a difficult thing. A double portion of Elijah's spirit, a difficult thing. Luke chapter 11, verse 5 to 12. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of his friendship with you, because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, and this goes back to our key verse, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then there's this addition to it. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead, or an egg will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more? Not a difficult thing. Freely giving to any who ask. You don't have to split the Jordan. You don't have to say, where, oh God, where now is the God of Elijah and split the Jordan? You need only ask. And it's yours. It's your inheritance. It's your portion on this side of the cross. God, our Heavenly Father, freely gives his own Holy Spirit to the children who ask him. Tim Keller once said, the only person who dares to wake up a king at 3 a.m. is a child. Everyone else will be intimidated. I can't ask. A child will just go, I need a cup of water. Can I get some bread? A child. Children have the audacity to ask. We all know, many of those who are ch parents here know, children have plenty of audacity to ask lots of audacious things. But can I tell you this morning, beloved, you are a child of God. We are children of God this morning. We are called to have childlike faith in our asking of him. And he delights, moreover, he delights in our asking. He, he's yearning to hear us ask. First John 3 verse 1, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. And in 1 John 3, 21, later on in the chapter, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. We have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. You don't have to chase a difficult thing, chasing the spirit of Elijah. Can I tell you something this morning? This is for somebody here. You don't have to chase someone else's anointing. You don't have to be here in church and say, oh, I wish I could preach like Jolly Uncle or Finney Uncle, or I, I wish I could sing like, like Faith just sang so beautifully, right? Or Marianne or, or Grace or any of these people. These people are so gifted. Oh, I want some of that. Lord, give me their portion. Give me a double portion of someone's spirit. Give me a double portion of Pastor Finney Samuel's spirit. You don't have to ask for that this morning. You have something better this morning. 
You have the Holy Spirit at your beck and call, at your disposal for your use. He wants you to use him. He's begging for the church to use him. And the Holy Spirit is often one of the most neglected things in the church, even in the Pentecostal church. We need to take him up on his offer. You're given God's Holy Spirit in abundant and unlimited measure. All that you could have and hold. D.L. Moody once was filled with the Spirit, and he was so overwhelmed. He said, Lord, stop, because I'm going to die if you keep filling me. That level is available to each of us. All we need to do is ask. Just ask. How many of us ask? How many of us even seek for such a thing? In this day and age, we have all these different resources at our disposal telling us how to live our lives. Facebook. WhatsApp for our, our parents' generation. WhatsApp. I get all these chain emails and messages, even very spiritual things on WhatsApp, TikTok, right? All these different things, very spiritual things, things about the Bible. It comes, it comes even to the point where we're learning more about God from social media than we are from our own relationship with God, or even in church. We learn more about God on our phone than we learn from the Bible or anything else. Can I submit to you? that the best way to know God is to meet and know him for yourself. The best way to know him is through his word, himself. Don't learn about God from someone else's experience with God. Learn about God from your own experience, talking with him, reading his word, knowing his character in your life, not in someone else's life, your own life. That is your inheritance. That's your privilege as a child of God, to know him intimately. How many of us ask things of God but spend no time with God? How many of us ask things of God without considering why we're asking or how we're asking? God does not give his children anything that is not good for them, just like any parent. We often ask for things that are not good for us, that are not in line with his will for our lives. It is inconsistent with his nature as a good father to do so. It is consistent in his nature as a good father to lavish all things on us that are for our benefit as his children in keeping with his will. Therefore, what we ask for and how we ask for it is reflective of whether we are asking in his name or our own name. There is an important distinction. To ask for the things that he wills for us to ask for, we must become more and more like him so that our appetites and desires mirror his own. Requests that honor him and his will are made in his name. And whatever we ask of him in that way, he will provide in the best way for us at the best time for us. We don't have to ask for a physical inheritance like Aksa did. The Holy Spirit is your inheritance. God himself is your inheritance. We are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. The Levites had no inheritance among the sons of Israel. God told them, I am your inheritance. You, the church this morning, the inheritance is not physical things. Your inheritance, your portion. Just as God told to Abraham, I am your shield. I am your exceedingly great reward. He is our reward. He is our portion. He is what we need. May we have the same audacious confidence that Uxa had coming before Caleb when it comes to going to God. There's another meaning for the name Uxa that I didn't say, and I kept it purposely behind. It means bursting through the veil. Bursting through the veil. A child who's bursting through the veil to see her father with a great relationship. May we also burst through the veil that was torn for us so that we could have access to the presence of God, to the Heavenly Father who is a rewarder of all who earnestly seek him. On the other side of that torn veil, Moses and Joshua had to go to the tent of the meeting to meet with God and to be in his presence. On that side of the veil, the people of Israel had to get up every time the cloud moved somewhere. They followed the presence of God. On this side of the veil, he placed eternity in our hearts by his Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us. On that side of the veil, Moses himself had to wear a veil to hide the presence of God, the glory of God. On this side of the veil, his presence is inside of us. We become his tabernacle. On this side of the veil, we have a great high priest who intercedes for us. And the veil itself is torn altogether. There is no veil. We have access like Aksa did with her father to burst through the veil with confidence, making our requests known to our heavenly father. Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest that is unable to empathize. We all know this verse with our weaknesses. But he was tested in every way as we were yet without sin. 
Let us then, in that context now, let us then, what? Boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. I'm going to read something from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7 to 18 that talks about the veil. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be that much more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much the glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away, our great high priest. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, beautiful, and we all, with unveiled faces, Contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I'm sorry, Pastor. I need to take a little more time. So sorry. As we contemplate the Lord's glory with unveiled faces, with a torn veil granting us perpetual access to his presence, we are being changed into his image. Hallelujah. We are being changed into his image with ever-increasing glory. As we change, our appetites change, right? This is, this is where we start to unlock how we understand God's purpose for our life and how to ask for things that we know please him, that we know he would lavish to grant us. Our appetites change. As we change, our supplications change. The things we care about change. Our ask become in line with his will for us because we are becoming more like him. Why would he not grant a request that he wills for himself? He's happy to do so. We ask in his name, accordance with his will, his plans, his pleasure for our lives, and he is happy to lavish his provision on those who ask in his name. I want to challenge all of us to examine our lives and to examine our asking this morning. Examine why you ask how you ask before you worry about what you're asking for. Also examine your relationship with him. We are in constant need of provision and supply. We are in need of his grace at every moment of our lives. We need it. We need his sustaining hand every moment. If you're praying for things, and I know many of you are, I have been. If your prayers are going up, but it seems like nothing is coming down, Look at your Lord, look at your Lord, and look at your asking. Persist in prayer. Fan your faith into flame. Let me comfort you with these words from our Lord, if that's you this morning. Matthew 6, verse 25 to 33. Again, one of the most common passages of Scripture. Therefore, I tell you, this is Jesus, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Cornerstone Church, are you not much more valuable than the birds? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. Can you imagine Jesus saying this? Imagine the field of flowers that are out there. Look at them. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was arrayed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, tomorrow, and is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? The pagans 
chase after all of these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows that you need them. But what? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. He knows what we need before we ask, and he gives good gifts to those who ask him. When we ask in his name, in recognition and acceptance of his position as Lord, with humility, faith, and confidence, and persistence, he is more than faithful to give us our daily bread. More than faithful. He is faithful when we are faithless, because he cannot deny who he is. His nature is a good father. He cannot deny his nature as a good father. People of God, ask audaciously. Ask audaciously. Pray big prayers in his name for his glory, for your lives, for your family's lives, for this church, for this city, for this nation. See what he does for you and for me. I'm going to read two more verses, and then I'm going to close. Ephesians 3, verse 10 to 12. His intent was that now, through the church, that's you and I, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom excuse me, and confidence. One of the most beautiful things that we often hear at the end of services, 14 to 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to know how to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What if we prayed that prayer instead of all the other prayers? If I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with all the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask, or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church, in Cornerstone Church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. May our good Lord bless you with these words.